Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for some of us uh, to this session. As part of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit on harnessing technology for the global goals. Um, my name is Antonia Gavel and I head our program on technology innovation for public goods at the forum. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all here today. So we're all here, I think really for two reasons. Um, one is that we know about the awesome power and potential of the fourth industrial revolution and the technologies that it brings to bear. But also the second is that we know that we desperately need a quantum leap really in progress towards achieving the global goals, which is why we look to solutions offered by technology and, and the fourth industrial revolution for a potential, let's say alternative path to complement all the work that we're doing. Um, so in January in collaboration with PwC, we launched a report and highlighted that about 70% of the global goals can be accelerated with the application of 4IR technology, things like big data, AI, and much more. But, and this is a pretty big but, um, it is not happening at scale and it won't happen at scale under current market conditions. The billions that are flowing into applying technology are currently flowing into market competitive applications, which of course makes sense. Um, but unfortunately, many of the global goals are cer certainly not uh, in, that, in that category. And so while we have a lot of great examples, applications, we need many, many, many more. And we also need to think about how we can scale these to help make progress. So that's what the 2030 Vision Partnership is really all about. It's a platform to bring together partners from across public, private sectors to really help unblock the barriers that are standing in the way of putting more FOIR technology to work for the goals. And our 2030 Vision co-chairs, Simon Seegers, Akim Steiner, will certainly tell us more about that in our panel. Another finding from our January report is that we need leadership, leadership from businesses, leadership from governments that translates then into action. And that's why following interviews with many executives, including some of you on the line with us today, the forum with PwC released a framework for corporate action this week as well. Celine is with us here and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that in one of the breakout groups also. We'll follow that work up with also further action on, on government leadership and frameworks to help define how governments are taking a leading role, but also what more can be done there as well. So we're, we'll certainly discuss some of that in our conversations also. So basically this session is really about trying to translate that vision of 2030 vision platform really into moving this agenda forward and taking some of these insights into collaborative action with all of you here today. Um, so first I just have to cover a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, for those of you who are joining on Toplink, you can feel free to maximize your, your screen, your Zoom. This is where we'll be for the next 90 minutes. Um, we do have a, a chat function. I'm sure many of you are used to this now. We really encourage you to share your ideas, your comments, your questions. Uh, we wanna integrate that into the conversation. Um, please do keep yourself on mute if you're not speaking, um, just to help us maintain a, a good flow here. Um, and finally, this segment of the, the presentation will be broadcast, but as we go into the breakout discussions, um, it will be Chatham House rules, so, so we won't be attributing any perspectives there. And the second point is that after the panel, we will break out into three breakout discussions. Um, so what we'll ask you to do is to pick which discussion you'd like to be a part of, giving us an opportunity to go a little bit deeper into some of these issues. So the first breakout, uh, focusing on global goals and the 4IR technology to help us fast track country level progress and recovery, so country action. Breakout two is focusing on establishing inclusive, secure, and ubiquitous connectivity as a prerequisite for advancing the global goals, so two, connectivity. And three is about the business case for technology leadership as a lever for sustained and sustainable growth. So breakout three, business. Um, and so what you can do, and you should see the instructions here, is put the number, rename yourself. There's a little button in the top right corner of your image. Rename yourself by putting the number of the group that you'd like to join at the beginning of your name. And that will help the team then put everybody into the right conversations. So I think that's, um, that's about it from me. And with that, I'd like to hand over the session really to, to Jennifer Schenker, who is the founder and editor in chief of The Innovator, uh, who will expertly guide us through the conversation. Thank you.
Thank you, Antonio. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our panelist, Achim Steiner, Administrator for the United Nations Development Program, Simon Seegers, CEO of ARM and the 2030 Vision Initiative, His Excellency, President Masisi of Botswana, and Jacqueline Fuller, CEO of Google.org. We're going to start by giving Akim and Simon one minute each to talk about why the 2030 initiative is so important and why they chose to be its co-chairs. Akim, let's start with you. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, in a minute, um, let me put it very briefly. In the midst of COVID-19, I think we have all been confronted with what it means to be digitally connected or not connected, whether you have children who can continue their education, whether you have access to telemedicine, whether you can access cash transfers. So I think the moment in which we find ourselves has really focused our attention on the significance of um, that digital revolution that is unfolding, that fourth industrial revolution. And for us and for me, who leads the UN's development program, you can put it in a very simple formula. The, the future of development is digital. And therefore, understanding how a technology led, but nevertheless also a revolutionary and transformative uh, set of developments are going to shape what happens in countries to each of us, in our economies, in our societies, is fundamental to making sure that we are able to achieve an inclusive outcome because technology can also be a great divider. And I think when the World Economic Forum established um, Vision 2030, what is very enticing about the idea of coming together is that we do really need to have the technology companies, but we also need governments who provide the regulatory framework. We need um, the world of investment. We need public, private, and citizens to really come together and shape this ecosystem around which digitalization um, is likely to transform every aspect of our lives. And just to have the privilege um, to co-chair with Simon, whose life is really um, in electronic engineering, semiconductors, microprocessing, leading a, a major company that is driving our ability to deploy digital. And for me to come from a public organization, the United Nations family, and I have other colleagues also in Division 2030 who are contributing, I think is, a, is an illustration of the power of partnership that we need, because this is truly an ecosystem we are shaping. This is not just technology, it's not just connectivity, it is the kinds of services that will either make the future as uh, nations, as economies, but also as a global family more livable, more sustainable, or potentially more divisive and, um, and exclusionary. And I think that is um, the idea that has brought us all together in working with the World Economic Forum as a platform to experiment what this could look like. And I think in the panel, Already you have a, a great illustration of that. So with that, back to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for um, painting uh, such a, um, uh, a great uh, picture of um, the importance of all of this. Um, so now let's turn to Simon. Um, please give us your perspective. Thanks, Jennifer. And uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Arm formed 2030 Vision in 2017 because we believe that technology, including the kind of technology that we design at ARM, can underpin every goal. But not just that, um, but because we believe that uh, cross-sectoral collaboration is critical uh, if we are to make the most progress. Um, because we will limit uh, what can be achieved if companies work alone, or if we work one by one with different UN agencies on different projects, it's just gonna be very fragmented and we won't make as much progress as we could. Further, uh, we'll be limited unless nations really do come together, including work done by NGOs, including civil society, everyone needs to pull together uh, on these objectives. So our conclusion is that we need an unprecedented level of collaboration across and within sectors, governments, and nations. So that's why uh, building on the initial success that we had with 2030 Vision, uh, we've recently merged with the World Economic Forum so that we can scale up these collaborative efforts. ARM's committed to uh, support 2030 Vision with both uh, financial resources, with uh, staffing, to really help this partnership. And I'm really excited to be working with Akin to lead 2030 Vision together, and with you, our partners, uh, turn all of this ambition and potential into action. Thanks a lot, back to you, Jennifer. 
Thank you for that inspiring overview. Um, let's now move right into our um, panel discussion. Um, so, and we'll start with Akim. Uh, the, the United Nations Development uh, Program is working actively with countries on their near-term COVID uh, response, as well as advancing longer term progress towards the SDGs. If we look to 2030, what would you like to deliver, ideally with the help of all the people who are participating and watching today? Um, well, many things, but uh, again, to, to perhaps pick a couple of aspects. Uh, one we need to connect the rest of the world. As of today, you know, probably 45 to 50% of the world's population still don't have access to internet and broadband. So we are in the midst of a world that is suddenly split into two, those who have access and can afford to have access and those who don't. So the first priority must be, and this is not just, you know, laying the cables, the fiber optic cables, it is also creating an economy that allows poorer people to be able to participate in that economy. But a second aspect is, and I'm sure the president of Botswana will address this also, you need to look at, for example, your education system. How do we enable and prepare young people to be able to succeed in that world? Because one of the great opportunities of this digital economy is that it is not as geographically and physically bound as you know, the story of the Industrial Revolution. Some of the greatest innovations are now happening across the African continent, in Asia. Um, it's a much more dispersed revolution. And I think the way that we can help to create economies in which um, people can thrive and poverty eradication. I mean, all these elements that we define in the Sustainable Development Goals can become part of it. And I personally have learned a lot in the last year and a half, particularly about fintech, digital finance. It is one of the greatest potential tools for bringing people who, you know, in the traditional financial system had no way of being able to participate. They could not borrow because they had no credit record, no physical address no account. Banks did not want to deal with them. We now have hundreds of millions of people um, trading on, transacting, borrowing in the morning, repaying in the evening, even as a market trader, money. This is capital becoming much more ubiquitous and available to poorer people. And that is very much the mission with which UNDP, and I'm sure my colleague Charlotte from UNICEF will speak to that later on as well, view that digital possibility in a, in a larger development setting. So by 2030, all the goals, the sustainable goals, will actually be more achievable if we make digital a part of it. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd love to turn to um, President Masisi. Um, Botswana was one of the first countries in the region to adopt a science and technology policy back in 1998 and has since been a regional pioneer in the developing um, the, a national innovation system. Uh, you recently established a multi-sector committee to work to align with the 2030 vision country facilitation. Can you tell us um, how you think the 2030 vision can provide a framework for recovery and resilience for your country post COVID-19? Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. And, uh... Good uh, evening to everybody on the panel. Um, I'm really glad that uh, that question was asked because uh, not only have we undertaken those um, changes in policy um, as a response to our, our uh, the challenges that we faced, but one of the best ways to actually respond to COVID-19 challenges is to fast track everything that, I was in our, that were in our plans for digitization. And in doing that, uh, it's the quickest and most democratic route to reaching everybody, including as many as you could, and reconfiguring our citizenry for the new world post COVID, which would take account of the threats posed by COVID and enhance efficiencies. Um, and so we, 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 we're, we, we, we're in a position where we have our digital transformation strategy and we're more than fired up to launch. And in launching, 
you know, as a country and a country in the middle of a region and a region in Africa, and Africa as part of the global community, we have a responsibility to make sure that the SDGs are achieved and digitization is an important part. The first, last point I want to make, and I think it might also um, attract Akim's attention and the others, you know, uh, global peace and security is an important um, ideal to work towards and assure. But it is important that we all keep our finger on the tap to make sure that people have the capacity, including governments, have the capacity to govern this new system. Because if they don't, there's every risk that uh, it may slip through and uh, goodness knows what will happen uh, to those who either misuse, underuse, or abuse. Um, so uh, we, we really look forward to uh, participating in on this and being the, the, the open national country laboratory to fast track SDG achievement. Thank you very much, President Masisi. Um, I'd now like to turn to uh, Jacqueline. Um, as the CEO of Google.org, please give us your perspective on how governments and tech philanthropy organizations can better partner together for impact. What changes are needed to broaden their impact given that we have so much more progress um, uh, to be made? Well, just to get very pragmatic about this, I mean, the thing that excites us about the SDGs is that it's not only a set of global goals, but it's also a blueprint. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel as companies to say, what should we do? That's there. It's just the question of how. And I think the question of how, we each need to ask ourselves, uh, what is our unique strength? What can we bring to the table? And how can we do that in collaboration with governments? Governments and markets are always going to be the big engines of scale. And government needs to lead on this. But tech companies and philanthropies can play a unique role. I'll give you a quick example. Google's been partnering with the government of India around flooding, severe flooding. It's one of the most common natural disasters. It literally impacts hundreds of millions of people, uh, largely poor people around the world, $10, million, $10 billion in damage each year. But the promise of artificial intelligence and machine learning is to say, can we not only respond to these natural disasters, but actually predict them with enough warning to save lives? So our AI experts have been working on modeling using machine learning, and they are now able to predict areas uh, that are prone to flooding and to issue alerts ahead of time. Now, we have been working with the government of India because Google can bring the data and we can develop the forecast. Governments certify, distribute, make sure that we're reaching everyone. And I think it was Akeem who mentioned this earlier, we need to make sure that we're reaching the most vulnerable with this technology. It can't just be technology uh, reaching the privileged. So for example, in this situation, we are covering literally now all of India, we're expanding into Bangladesh, we're covering 240 million people through this. So google.org's role is to also work with local entities like the Red Cross to ensure that People, uh, for example, uh, who don't have a smartphone, who don't have connectivity, are still reached through these alerts. And so we're building the local networks who are reaching out. And these alerts are now arriving as much as four days earlier um, than provided by the traditional alert system. So that's just one example of collaboration that is built fundamentally around partnership with government. And the UN Roadmap for Digital Cooperation has lots of ways that all of us can get involved. Thank you, um, Jacqueline. That's a very strong example of impact. Um, Simon, um, as the leader of a global technology company, what impact do you want to see out of the 2030 Vision Initiative? And why is now such a, cr a critical moment for us to be advancing these kind of partnerships? Great, thanks. Um, so it's, it's a great question. And I, I think there's a lot that can be learned from what we've just seen through uh, the COVID-19 crisis. 
Because um, when I look at that, I, I think the, um, it, it's, it's really quite amazing to see the responses from uh, companies, from governments. It, it's really shown what's possible when there's collaboration to overcome a challenge with a really focused goal in sight. I, I think it's just been amazing to see what people have done um, across the, the whole spectrum, but including really employees within companies who've all kind of wanted to uh, make a difference. They've wanted to react. They've realized that what they do, the skills they have, the skills they've developed through their careers can be applied to you know, what has been, frankly, the, the biggest health crisis any of us have, have ever experienced. So when I look at, at that and what went on over, what has gone on over the last, well, through this year, um, and we think about the kind of collaboration that we're going to need to address the challenges posed by the global goals, that's really what I hope to see catalyzed through 2030 Vision Partnerships. People realizing that what they do can make a difference, um, accompanied with a sense of urgency. Um, because in order to achieve real results through this decade, it's imperative that we begin the real work now. There are things that all of us can do as individuals, of course, there are decisions we can make in our daily lives, you know, whether we use public transport, a car, um, what we do about single-use plastic, things like that. But to really tackle the global goals, uh, which are enormous in scope, that requires some, some big thinking. It requires uh, coordination of many constituencies, governments, businesses, NGOs, and across all of the sectors, as I said earlier. So what I want to see is 2030 Vision being a place where people can do that. Um, the people who are asking themselves, what can I do to help, have a place to go and projects that they can dive into to bring their skills to really make a difference. Thank you, Simon. So you, you have all um, highlighted some exciting solutions. Uh, so what do we need to see more of to achieve scale? Could each one of you please highlight one inspiring example or a solution area that you're most excited about that illustrates how tech can advance the global goals? Who would like to start? I'm happy to go. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the, my favorite example at the moment is, is a company I uh, came across recently based in uh, Texas, a uh, company called Hypergiant, big name, big ambition as a company that they have. And they've built what they call their EOS bioreactor. Uh, and this is a machine for extracting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So it's addressing the climate crisis. Um, but what it does is, is pairing a really ancient technology, algae, which Apparently it's been on the earth for something like 1.6 billion years. Um, and they're growing it in an environment controlled by an AI system. Um, it's looking at the uh, pH balance of the water that the algae is growing in. It's looking at the lighting conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And it's optimizing the growing conditions for the algae, which is really, really efficient for attracting CO2. So you're taking a really old technology, a really modern technology, putting it together into a, um, a machine that looks really cool. It looks like something out of a sci-fi movie. Um, but it's really, really efficient because they're optimizing the conditions for the algae. And it can extract between 60 and 90% of the CO2 uh, that flows through the system. So it's a great example of a bunch of people have come together with a smart idea. They've brought their experience from biochemistry, engineering, computer science. They've put all that together to create a solution to what is one of uh, the world's biggest problems. And they're starting to scale it up. They're, they're seeing a lot of interest from companies and governments around the world, um, and seeing that scale up to a massively deployed system would be fantastic. So it's a really fantastic example. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Jacqueline, you already gave us a great example uh, with India. I got, I got tons of them. I'm sure you have <laughs> others. <laughs> you know what's super exciting to a tech company is data. And I think uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about is Google is not only specific solutions, which we are working on, but how can we help build the entire ecosystem? How can we put out the fundamentals into the ecosystem so everyone, whether you're an academic researcher or government or a nonprofit or a company, help create these solutions? Uh, so when we went out and surveyed and asked, uh, you know, frontline uh, folks, uh, innovators, researchers, government, what were the critical barriers they were facing to actually getting pragmatic solutions for the SDGs? Number one thing that came up actually was data and lack of, you know, publicly accessible uh, 
data sets that are serving the needs of the poor and the most vulnerable and that are gathered in a way where there's clear structured data, um, that privacy is protected. And so we've been working with others. We partnered with the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, the governments of Canada and Germany to launch the Lacuna Fund in order to develop and make available these kinds of data sets. So just as a specific example, we recently just closed a call for proposals um, for labeled data sets around agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa. So when you get this kind of high quality data, that can help the innovators to unlock um, questions around yield estimation or livestock management, or even helping with conflict resolution locally between say pastoralists or crop farmers. So this is an area where we think we can um, be helpful by providing our funding as well as providing some tech expertise from Googlers um, themselves. Thank you very much. Um, President Masisi, are there, is there a particular area that you are most excited about or that you'd like to see? Yes, indeed. Um, we are a developing country. And uh, as I said, we have uh, put together our uh, um, uh, transformation, digital transformation strategy. And we've got one specific exciting project that we want to unleash and invite those who are um, as exciting, as excited and as excitable uh, of, the, of the, the product as, uh, as we are. It's, uh, it's called the Maung Science Park. I don't know how many of you know Maung. I know Aiton does. Maung is just on the fringes of the Okavango Delta in Botswana. And there we want to establish a science park in which we'd use the latest technology, right, um, to uh, develop, uh, you know, eco-friendly uh, habitats uh, using even 3D mapping and develop uh, uh, a living, a livable environment in which uh, people uh, thrive out uh, uh, an existence um, out of it um, and, and, and even try out some of the innovations that some of our young people uh, would have done, including networking um, with researchers. Um, uh, and so as one of our major projects to try and help digitize and capacitate our people and our institutions, uh, we're planning uh, very, very hard on developing the Mountain Science Park. We have a three-year planning cycle. So we're very specific about what actions we want done in the next three years. And uh, those are some of the things that uh, we discussed with the UNDP rep and their, and their committee when they meet. So um, we don't have a, a project as, as exciting as you know what Google has been doing, uh, but uh, uh, watch the space, we're coming uh, uh, right up, uh, up your alley. Great, thank you so much. And Let's um, work together, Your Excellency. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's why we're here, you know. Um, um, and Simon and uh, Nakim uh, committed last time, so did uh, Sarah, who is she? Yeah, she's there, um, including ODI. So uh, we, we, we're in. Um, yes. I am, I am dead set to meet you guys in two weeks digitally and we put pen, pen, pen to paper and uh, we move. Okay, um, that's a deal, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And all I can say is, I mean, Google has a global network, but nobody has Moan and the Okavango swamps, right? So it's a, it's a location <laughs> that's really attractive for anybody who wants to move out of the madness of what's happening to us. But Jennifer, can I, I offer... Yeah, yes, sorry, please. please. Sorry, I was just going to say that, you know, the examples that uh, Jacqueline was giving, you could take them to scale right from the Mount Science Park and look at the diversity of challenges and opportunities that you find in the continent of Africa with 1.3 billion people. Huh? You know, from uh, the ecology to climate to, you know, peace building and um, education, skills development, you know, mineral exploration, you know, governance and government. Um, you know, Google, Google could be really famous out of this, right? <laughs> Your Excellency, we will definitely follow up. Great. So, Ahim, please give us your, uh, the thing that you're excited about. Well, I was going to provide <clears throat> some more examples from Africa, but I think uh, President Masisi has just shown that, you know, 
you just need to let your imagination play right now. And, you know, that digital world suddenly becomes not confined to one space anymore. So I will just share, and, and forgive me, I have to be a good faith UN official, so I will pick from the Indian subcontinent just three examples in 40 seconds because they speak to different aspects. One, Bangladesh. Since a number of years, they have invested in the digital infrastructure, the kind of digitalization strategy that President Masisi spoke to. In the midst of COVID, a few weeks, they were able to set up a telemedicine platform, train 4,000 doctors, over 350,000 people have been able to access that service in a number of weeks. Pakistan, in less than two months, 16 million households reached, 80 million people provided cash transfers. This platform did not exist before, uh, to the point of data that uh, Jacqueline was speaking to. You know, we can mobilize things to happen extremely quickly. And then India's commitment to, in the next 1,000 days, connect 450,000 villages. I repeat, in the next 1,000 days, 450,000 villages to fiber optic. Um, these are the kinds of generational projects. That's the kind of imagination we need. That's why the SDGs are not beyond reach, even though we have just experienced a terrible setback. It is a drama, but um, there is no silver bullet, but digitalization could be one of the ways in which we can recover and actually accelerate. Thank you.